really practice that vocabulary with each other in the attempt to strengthen one another's ability to be able to apply for this funding and to be able to make a strong case for why my project, why now, why this community, why this grant. And, um, and I think that that's <coughs> empowering to all of us in the sense that, uh, you know, language is power and, and having that language of the funders is difficult and annoying and frustrating and I can completely sympathize with that. By the same token, I read those grant applications and I like to see someone who's articulate, who's thought it through, who can show me impact, who can show me that they've considered all of these options, that they've considered ways to measure and evaluate. And yeah, it's the boring stuff, but it's so necessary. It's so, so necessary. So I hate to be kind of like the downer in the room, but I just, I wanna bring that in early because I think that it sets a, a sort of framework that's important to outline just at the beginning and also to push against it. So I'm not like singing its praises. I'm just kind of naming it and putting it in the room. Um, but just a little further along, um, my personal belief is that socially engaged practice is really about working from need. It's working from where there is a need for something to happen, whether it's a conversation or a social action or a direct action or collective action. So uh, for me, I think it's kind of like, who, who is this for and why? And why now? And why this? And in what way? So working directly from what the source of that need is rather than I have a story I need to tell, my need is my personal need. Really, it's about how do you <laughs> kind of feel out what's in the ether, what the need of the ether is. Um, and I think that that is often, that often leads to a kind of grassroots based approach. So you're working more from bottom up, getting a consensus and getting a feel for what the need is around you in your immediate locale and your immediate community, rather than kind of helicoptering in with, I wanna work in this place. I wanna go there and work with those people. I wanna go there. So I think also again, the funding community is more interested in this rather than this right now. They're more interested in locally engaged, community-based, creative practice, creative practitioners. Um, so I'm not gonna use the word we, I'm gonna say they, I'm gonna keep them. <laughs> but yeah, I am part of that we. Um, and then finally, I, I just wanna, um, Maybe distinguish. Can we just uh, make sure? Sorry, could you just I'm Jonathan? Sorry, can you just mute mute your um, Jonathan? Could you mute your yeah. uh, microphone for a second? Sure, I'll find a way to do that. Hello, everybody. Apologies for being late. Perfect. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce you in a in a minute. So hang on, uh, and uh, I'm so glad you could join us. But oh, I'm sorry, Jonathan. So glad you could join us, and uh, we'll. Uh, I'll get back to you in a minute. So when you're not speaking, if you could just keep your uh, microphone muted, that that helps with the feedback here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, thanks, JJ. Yeah. Can, Can I just make one like final little point? Mm -hmm. I won't belabor this, but I do. I I want to kind of also put in the room a false dichotomy that socially engaged practice always has to work on a nonprofit model. I don't think it does. I don't think we're talking strictly about nonprofit versus commercial. Um, so I kind of want to challenge that as well and push back against that. But I will put out there that I think that the gift economy is something that is, um, needs to be further explored and better understood and what that actually translates to in terms of art artistic practice and how we work and how we get the things that we need and also how we perpetuate a generosity of spirit that gives more back to our own community and, and back to our fellow practitioners and how do we increase the abundance of everybody's work um, overall. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. JJ. Uh, somebody from the side? Uh, Can we introduce Jonathan? Yeah. Um, I think I, I did a little bit already. Hi, Jonathan, welcome. Um, Jonathan, as I, as I mentioned, is artistic director of the Fence. And, uh, um, I think I said uh, the Fence is an international network for working playwrights and people who make playwriting happen across Europe and beyond. Uh, Jonathan, we've been uh, discussing these questions. I keep wanting to look at him up there, but I should look at him over there <laughs> so he could see me. Um, 
the questions of what socially engaged theater is, what that means to you, how you <coughs> use it, how you how what that means in terms of your actual uh, artistic practice, and then how you determine the effectiveness of what you're doing. Those are the questions that we're dealing with. Um, should I ask him to? Yeah. Do you want to? Uh, you want to hang in and listen for a bit, and then jump in later? Sure. That sounds like a very good plan. Okay. okay. Great. Well, we're so glad you're here, and we'll get back to you. Uh, somebody uh, on this side want to jump in? Um, I'll jump in. Uh, Rebecca Martinez, and uh, another another thing that for me is I work with Sojourn Theater, but I also work with the Center for. Performance and Civic Practice, also founded by Michael Rode. And one of the things that, in, in terms of definition, because there are so many floating definitions about what, what is socially engaged, what is community engaged, what are these things, how do they appear to public, where we've actually worked to define for ourselves clearly what this means. And when we talk about uh, social practice, is actually how we phrase it, is maybe the spark or the creative idea comes from artists and then is there then there's a match found in the community and maybe the artist is the one working in response to the community as in oh i see that this is happening we are having an interaction and then i create the work and an additional uh, work that we do as well is called civic practice which is where it's actually the the partnership is something that starts first where the artist and the non-art sector community partner come together and have a conversation or, or build a relationship that very much involves the artist and this is also we work with artists who are not theater based artists as well but they start the conversation and the artist is creating really actively listening to what the uh, the partner is saying and specifying as their needs and then the work comes out of that. Could you give an example just so that we get a clearer idea what you mean? Of civic practice? Yeah, yeah. yeah we're actually working, uh, a, a collaboration is happening now with Nashville and they are doing work with uh, public art, mm -hmm. artists who are working in public art and to just talk about this idea of how as a public artist, how do you go into a community? How do you talk to someone? How do you, how does your, work sit in community and is created in relationship. So not just going in and here I'm putting my art in this area, but I'm having a conversation with maybe an organization or a, for example, a, an organization that works with people who are experiencing homelessness. So how does my conversation and my work and finding the needs of what those people in that community have in um, <coughs> then create the work listening to what that is, which may very well change what that is, because maybe they don't need a big sculpture, maybe what they want is a table where they can sit and eat lunch or something like that. So mm. thinking about mm. that in terms of what needs are. Mm. Great, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, you got, uh, John, you wanna? Uh, responding a little bit to what JJ was talking about, uh, fighting for the idea of the arts as being something useful in society. Uh, I feel like <laughs> we've been uh, going down to Washington and sort of fighting for this for a long time, this idea that the arts are useful, and explaining uh, what, the, what theater has to do with conflict resolution. And I say, uh, well, what story have you ever seen? What play, what child's fairy tale, what myth have you ever seen or heard that wasn't about a conflict and how it gets resolved and that's what makes it interesting. So I, I think like slowly over the years sort of like pushing that idea that theater is in fact conflict resolution or problem solving uh, and um, maybe they're finally getting it. So this is, this is great and I, I find that even around the world people are sort of getting that. Uh, I think that we were sort of last in line to a certain degree. Uh, in getting that idea because people have been using theater as a way to carry information, as a way to engage communities for centuries and we're just sort of um, last on the bandwagon. Um, then uh, I think all theater should be engaging, uh, of course. I like that you said by, for, and with uh, communities because it's different working with a community than working for a community. 
And uh, over the last decade, we've ended up specializing in two things that wasn't really our grand scheme of things, but working very, very quickly with uh, people that have no theater training whatsoever. And so because we were working in Afghanistan with women, uh, we ended up creating um, all women's theater groups. And these women and girls that we were working with had never seen theater and had no experience with theater whatsoever. So we're really starting from scratch. And I had to think back on like, what, what did I learn in Theater 101? What were the exercises we did? And you know, you really have to kind of start with, um, well, first of all, you face outward towards the audience and take your hands away from your face and you know, sort of some basic things. But um, the working with artists is, of course, always so much fun because we all speak the same language wherever we go in the world. We can always work peer to peer with other artists. We all have the same games. We all have the same exercises. It's always remarkable to me that that's true. Wherever you go, artists speak the same language. You can, you can do something immediately. It's not like there's no standing around, uh, what do you want to do? I don't know, what are you going to do? <laughs> it's like you can really just jump in. It's, it's so encouraging. Um, but this idea of creating something very quickly is um, a challenge that we've been facing. And so we've, we've come up with some specific methods that so we can create a play in a week. And uh, just a week ago, we returned from Azerbaijan, or maybe two weeks ago. And uh, we were um, commissioned by the embassy, which is very nice, to work with uh, university students and create a play. And they said, uh, can you train the students and then uh, create a play and then we'll tour around the whole country and um, you'll come for a week, okay? <laughs> and I was like, well, I think we might need more than that. So I was sort of like going for a month we compromised at three weeks. So we had one, three, one week of training with tw uh, 22 students, and then we worked with uh, a select number of them to create a play in one week. And uh, they were not theater students. I think there were a couple that were theater students. And uh, then we toured around the country for the, the, the third week, and <laughs> we did it. <laughs> I don't know how, but you know, like we pull these things out of our back pocket, and it just, you know, it just works, and everybody just, um, Everybody gets it, you know, they kind of get it. It takes a little while. Maybe the first couple of days you're like, what are these people doing with us? This is really weird. And then after a while they kind of see it all fall <laughs> together and uh, then they play <coughs> and you know, it's fun. So uh, I think the reason why we do socially engaged theater besides the fact that it's really fun is that, um, you know, you're, you're bringing something to the community. It's like a gift and um, you can speak about topics that were never spoken about before. And this is always interesting, because once, once the cat's out of the bag, there's no putting it back. Once you've talked about domestic violence and that was never talked about, it's out there. And even if they're sitting there like this and they don't want to talk about it, it's in their brains now. And that's, that's really always exciting. Uh, we're always dealing with topics that don't want to be talked about, even just getting girls on the stage to speak. And uh, the fact that they're there is a social engagement. Because now they know they can do that, and now other people know they can do that. And there's no putting that back in the box either. Um, relating to the idea of evaluation, I think there's two different kinds of evaluation. There's the evaluation you do for the funders, which, you know, you just do it, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we can talk about that, but it's a little boring. <laughs> uh, and then there's evaluation you do for yourself. And, you know, we go back. We always invest a certain amount of time in the community. We don't just sort of drop in and then goodbye. We go back again and again. And that's where we can really see that we made a difference. And um, that's the best way to evaluate. Because you see what they learned and then what they did with it, how they took the ball and ran with it. And then, then you learn again from what they just did, and then you offer something else, and it's back and forth. So that's the real evaluation. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, so I I uh, I teach. Um, I write plays with um, advocacy in mind or, or s social content, I guess. I I create work in communities. So. Uh, the Tenderloin Opera Company, we work with people who are homeless. And uh, 
uh, I, I network, and I, I do all of these things on, on a barely functional level, but uh, not non-functional, so I, I, I keep falling forward into it. Um, my, my thinking about this is, is um, well, let's see if I could be compact about it. Um, drama is made of change, change in fortune from good to evil and evil to good, but also change in energy, spiritual energy and cardiovascular energy. It's just made of change, and those changes are made socially. Um, we must be making out of change and in a social manner because we intend to cause social change. As we are made, so we, so we do. In order for that change to be sustainable, it should be, on the one hand, grounded in the source of being itself, so pre-articulate, um, an energy before the property of language, and then in the not yet, that which is, has yet to be, in that space of hope and possibility. The activity, or the, the medium best suited to, m to uh, uh, ferrying the not, uh, the uh, pre-articulate into the not yet, is a poetic language, which is a language so vibratory, vibrating so quickly that it's almost invisible. So we're after creating a, s a social experience centered on a kind of silence and invisibility that is radically unstable and always creative and about to, about to be created. That's why someone like um, Donald Trump is anti-art because he's about social fixity, social immobility or un unchangeability where there is a kind of persistence of entitlement that will never go away, that's irrefutable, that can be walled, walled up. So artists by operating outside of the bounds of conventional language and property uh, destabilize uh, ownership through the social spectrum. I hope, I hope that that's right. In, in, <laughs> in, in terms of, in terms of um, uh, assessment, um, I feel that my work is going well the more silent and invisible I am. The more it moves rhizomatically away from my listening and into others speaking, and the more that that speaking itself voids itself and vacates itself and becomes silent until there is an infection of listening, and then ultimately all the world will be listening and the only art will be the music of the spheres. It, it may take a couple of years, <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, that's, I guess that's the idea. Yes, clap. Hallelujah. Yeah, that was like a poem. <laughs> it was beautiful. Um, so the Bechtel Project, my name is Jens Rasmussen. The Bechtel Project um, was born out of an observation of a need. Our mission is to tell stories that pass the Bechtel test, which uh, we'll admit is uh, on one level arbitrary. Our goal, though, is to change culture by changing the stories we tell. We believe that the stories that we see too often push women to the, to the peripheries of the stories and that by being careful about the stories we choose to tell, that the stories we tell, uh, uh, the stories we tell, the stories we imbibe uh, affect the way we see the world and the way we see ourselves in the world and that we need more stories that put women at the center of the stories or as Virginia Woolf said, uh, women that are not shown only in relationship to men. Um, so we'll know that we've achieved our mission when our mission is irrelevant, when, when everyone else is telling stories that, that make uh, our existence uh, uh, unnecessary. Uh, in our education program, we have more concrete ideas for, um, what's the word? Uh, our success. Uh, in our education program, we actually start each exercise or each uh, residency with uh, asking the participants to draw a, a hero. We, we, they take a piece of paper and they draw their idea of a, of a hero. And then we go through the entire workshop of, of exercises and discussions, and then uh, we have them draw a hero again. And uh, the changes in that drawing 
is kind of remarkable. When we stole that idea from the draw scientist studies, there's decades of research about the draw scientist and, and people's image of a scientist is of course what you would expect, an old white man with glasses and a lab coat and blah, blah, blah. There are similar, we're finding similar uh, preconceptions about what a hero looks like. And again, you wouldn't be surprised, predominantly male and, and things like that, strong, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, that's all I have to say right now. Um, yes, my name is Chantal Bizodo, and I, my work um, for the last 10 years, my work has focused mainly on climate change. Um, and I, I, it's funny, in coming to this uh, day today, I had to think about uh, how I define socially engaged um, practices because I wouldn't have included myself in that category, I guess, uh, because I inherited the, the definition from um, funders, <laughs> and I do not fit in that category because usually they want work that's being done directly with communities to respond to a need in that specific community, and that's not um, what I do. Um, I My plays are a mix of, I guess, documentary and fiction, so I travel to the place I'm going to write about. It's usually because I'm writing a, a series of plays about the countries of the Arctic. Um, I go and visit those regions and talk to the people, and then the resulting um, play is a mix of conversations I've had, people I've met, and then some of my own research. And um, that play doesn't necessarily go back there. I mean, I would like to, but sometimes there aren't even theaters in those regions. Um, so it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit uh, bringing stories of uh, people who we don't hear their story specifically in here in the developed world, but what we do in terms of uh, climate change affects them a lot. And um, so it's, it's kind of uh, being a, a translator bring bringing the their stories to um, us to be able to understand what's going on. Um, on the other hand, uh, I do, I so I yeah, so I'm coming back to this definition and I've, in thinking about it, I, I think so maybe socially engaged theater is um, something that responds to a need, a very specific need, immediate need um, in society. And in that sense, I would include what I do um, in that definition. Um, I do think that um, climate change is a big problem for sure, but it's a symptom of something much larger, that um, a sort of existential crisis on the at the level of civilization and our ability to address it will, will determine how we continue to evolve as a civilization. Um, we don't, uh, we, the story, we don't have the stories yet in the mainstream at least that are allowing us to make a, a big shift. This is a big transition I believe and if we in the theater, and I think the theater is really the place to do this because we are um, small, we are local, and we are in the best place to create these new stories and tell these new stories that are pretty, can, can be very shocking, um, and then plant those seeds one by one and then see them grow. And it will take a time, it will take, a, a t it will take some time before it grows to, something that's more mainstream, but I think it, it is our responsibility to start. Um, and then in terms of impact, I would love to, I'm actually thinking right now about sort of scientific uh, ways to measure impact um, because it would be useful if I can do that with what I'm doing, which has to do with climate change, then we can apply that to everything. Um, but the impact that I've had is like, I think like everybody else, it's been anecdotal. So, and it's, it, I find that it's more most powerful when you don't ask for it. Um, it's, you know, when you, when you ask people to fill surveys, 
it's selected, you know, they p people pre-select and then it's in the moment, but the most satisfying impacts I've seen are people who will write to me afterwards and say, like for example, the most recent one I've had was a student, um, I, had a, I presented a play at Kansas State University and a student wrote to me about two weeks after somebody I didn't meet <coughs> who wasn't in the theater. She just mm -hmm. came to see the show and she's an undergraduate student and she wrote that um, she wasn't aware of these things, that the play opened her eyes and as a result um, she's in an English class where she has to write a uh, research paper and she decided she was gonna write it about climate change. So this was, um, for me, it was very satisfying and it had a huge impact on that person and I was very pleased that she took the time um, to write to me and tell me about it, but I felt that that was uh, one of the biggest success because it was, um, <coughs> first of all, it wasn't somebody I worked directly with and also she chose to reach out to me to tell me her experience, so it, it felt like it was very genuine. Great, thanks Chantal. Um, you only, okay, gonna go, okay, go for Tracy. Uh, I just wanted to respond to uh, Chantal quickly. I'm, I'm a very, I've been thinking a lot about impact, um, and I'm very interested in your uh, thinking about the scientific ways to measure impact. Um, that could be a great breakout group. Um, so a lot of the things I work with, like I've, I did a, one of your climate change events, um, and I also last year I've been working with a Syrian playwright and, and translating and presenting his work in the U.S. And with that type of thing, rather than, it's not, you know, there's not um, a way to really measure the direct impact. We hope that through presenting that work, we, people will empathize and be able to kind of take this giant problem and make it smaller. But for me as an artist, it's always a struggle to see with, when you're working with such large, huge issues that are kind of incomprehensible, and somewhat unsolvable for us in a room like this, how do you measure impact and is it even important? Is the impact enough that you hope that someone's viewpoint has changed or you hope that they go on and educate themselves and can you follow up with that? Um, so I think that's something even when I did your climate change event, you know, we were so focused on, okay, what can people take away from this? What action can they do? And I don't know if that focus is always good as an artist or if, we should, if I should just relax and say, Hopefully they do something, um, but that's something I struggle with and that's something I'm curious to hear from other people in the room later. Um, is impact important? Is it important to measure impact? And in what circumstances um, is that important? Okay, uh, Sarah? Yeah, hi. Um, I am thinking right now about um, Jessica's description of Issa's big ass idea because um, I find that really inspiring and, um, and I think as I'm sitting here and listening, I'm, I'm realizing that there's lots of people in this room who have sort of influenced me um, in the work that I'm doing right now. I'm sort of new, I guess, in a way to um, thinking of my work as socially engaged practice. Um, and I'm actually also thinking of it uh, from a visual arts perspective right now too. Um, so I think there's this, uh, <coughs> So like relating to what Rebecca was saying about the public art, um, I, I'm just really interested in that interdisciplinary aspect of things and, um, and the conversations that influence and resonate no matter where they happen. Um, uh, I, I, and so just to tell you a little bit about uh, the project I, I'm engaged in right now that's my big ass idea is um <laughs> it's called 36.5 a durational performance with the sea um a, a, and i stand in a tidal bay it's a series of works performances where i stand in a tidal bay starting at low tide and i let my uh, i let the water rise up to my neck and then it goes back down again so it takes uh between 12 and 13 hours usually and um and it really, it started in when I was at an artist residency in Maine on a very small scale um, uh, and really was just an, a, an idea that I had in this moment uh, because I was thinking about uh, the challenge of artists uh, to survive in New York. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I was also thinking about in parallel to that and I was seeing this connection to the challenge of humans to survive in the face of sea level rise. Um, and I saw this tide rising and I just, and I, it covered this rock and 
I just imagined a human out there. <laughs> and I was like, I have to create that image. And I'm a director, so I was like, who can I get to do this? And then I realized no one was gonna do it for me. <laughs> so I had to do it myself. And, and then as I was out there in the water, I really had this moment where I was like, oh, I think I have to keep going with this. I think this is a series. Um, and I think I have to try to do it um, in different parts of the world. And so that's what I'm doing. So I did it in Maine and then Mexico and then San Francisco and the Netherlands last summer. And then um, next year, or this year, ha, it will be in Bangladesh. <laughs> um, so, and, and then the idea is to go to every continent. And I think I got that idea from Chantal actually because she was like, the Arctic, um, and uh, and and then come back to New York in 2020, and and I guess as I'm <coughs> I'm learning, I feel like every play, every iteration that I do, I'm learning what it means to be um, engaged in the community and what it means to um, to have a socially engaged practice in some way, um, and and I love what Eric said about the infection of listening um, because I think that that. Uh, that is uh, that resonates with me deeply in terms of how I approach things. Um, and for me, I guess uh, if I was, as I was thinking about it before, I was thinking about it's it's about connecting to strangers. It's about creating space for conversation. It's about surprising people um, in positive ways. <laughs> um, and it's and it's about thinking locally, like very personally, and thinking globally. Um, very universally, and that dichotomy, that binary. So, I guess uh, I just wanted to ask a follow-up about um, how do you engage the community um, in, in specifically yeah. with this kind of work? Sure. So, um, so I, uh, I when I go into a location now, and this is developed over the course of the different iterations, but um, I invite people to come stand with me in the water. And um, and there is a in San Francisco we develop I developed a movement phrase with um, with a choreographer and so and then she started it and then it got passed along so that the public is invited to participate in this movement phrase that happens after every hour that I've been standing out there um, so it's really subtle but it um, but I've actu actually in terms of impact I think one of the most meaningful things that has happened to me was in the Netherlands. Um, I had a couple old men tell me that that they had like they they go in the water almost every day, but that standing in the water with me for an hour, they both stood for an hour, um, that they had this completely different sensorial experience and totally changed their idea of uh, of body embodiment and water sensation and resonating on all these themes. And to me, that was that was actually. Uh, one of the most meaningful things, because they had this, they were surprised. They didn't think that it would happen, or they would have a new experience, and yet they did. Um, so that's yeah, yeah. great. No, thank you. I want to bring Jonathan sure. uh, Meth in. Uh, Jonathan, hey, there you are in London. Uh, it's good to see you. We're seeing you on a, a big screen here at La Mama Downtown Theater Space. Um, how do you uh, respond to these questions for in your own work? Um, hello, David, um, and everybody, and lovely to see you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. very good. Great. Um, so m my work um, covers a range of, of different things, so I might kind of move around a little bit in the answers that I try to give to what I've heard so far today. Um, I don't know if my practice is socially engaged since the first question was about definition. I guess other people will determine that. Um, uh, one of the things that I that I I heard just just um, in this last few bits of conversation was was the difference between that which is top down and that which is bottom up, and I guess I see the function of curating a network as trying to inhabit the space in between, and I think probably a lot of my work tries to inhabit a space in between. Let me say a little bit more about what that might mean beyond a sort of abstract idea. Um, it kind of links to a sort of philosophical premise as well, which is the notion that the center is everywhere. Um, various people have attributed it to Pascal or indeed people that go back a few centuries beforehand. But I've always quite liked that as a notion. 
um, particularly in relationship to things like mainstream and margins, which often influence discourses around uh, diversity or indeed disability um, and even gender. Uh, when we tend to talk about things um, in particular kinds of ways. I like the idea of the center being everywhere because it allows for possibilities to be generated in all sorts of different ways from all sorts of different directions. And whilst it's very important to acknowledge that power does indeed institutionally usually move from the top to the bottom and need is often best articulated from the bottom upwards to the top, the possibilities of where an impetus might come from in relationship to something that might have meaning for some people in relationship to artistic practice seems to me to be very varied. And that my interest is to try to engage and capture the possibilities of that variation. So if I just go back a little bit, I spent 15 years running what would be described as a grassroots, very much bottom-up organization in the UK whose remit was to support playwrights and a playwriting culture uh, across uh, the islands, uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, um, and to try to make sure that, that artists, in this case playwrights, didn't suffer from what we call in the UK a, a, a postcode lottery, where depending on where you happen to live and the level of access you might have to local provision depends on your experience and your life as an artist. So that's my background. Um, uh, what I learned from that was that, um, th that whilst the main stage play on the Royal Court might be capturing most of the press and the column inches and a large slice of public discourse, actually the playwright that's working with a group of single mothers on a housing estate in East Yorkshire um, is just as valid and just as important. And so that formed part of my practice in trying to develop a playwriting culture and to encourage playwrights to think of themselves as multidimensional creatures um, who were quite capable, should their interests and passions and engagements dictate, of moving and working in all sorts of different contexts. The natural movement then from that sort of impetus is to create and curate a network where you try to bring people together um, in this case now through the fence across Europe and in increasingly internationally towards some kind of opportunity that might generate possibilities for what might be socially engaged practice. But that ultimately, whether that impetus comes from the artist or the circumstances or the geography or the encounter or an analysis of social need or the kind of existential crisis that Chantal was talking about, um, I have no great things to say. Um, I do believe that the possibilities come from people seeing things in slightly different ways. And I think partly that might be my job. Shall I leave it there and see if people have got comments or questions? That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, perfect. That, yeah, so it's, uh, it's all about creating the possibilities for those things to happen. That, that's great. I want to bring in uh, Eva and Jessica into the conversation. So uh, uh, Eva? Um, well, I feel quite humbled to be up here because um, I and I, uh, in my life in general and especially in my art life and especially here, I try to own the mantle of the youngest child, the one who doesn't, who presumes that they don't know very much, um, which I think informs a lot of my practice. Um, because what I think when I think of social engagement, I think about um, creating an opportunity to denaturalize the systems, the ways of behaving within the systems that we're a part of. So thinking about the funding models that we're a part of, the institutional context that we have to navigate, there are these implicit value systems inscribed into that. And so what I hope to be doing always, especially, and I think you know, theater and performance is the ideal context for sort of like new social conditioning um, with people is to create a space that has a very specific set of ethics and um, that those ethics inform the way that you engage people in the room, on an institutional level, on a funding level, and it does bring in these really important questions of like, how do you access resources? How do you access funds? What kinds of decisions, if, you know, if I've created an ethical <coughs> process that says that, you know, I have to be considerate of the, you know, ecosystem that I'm a part of, both creatively, materially, conceptually, how do I then make decisions about 
and, and do I even have the luxury of making decisions about these practical things? Um, and so that's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, and so I think that, so maybe just to make it a little more concrete, like my, my current project takes the performance logic of the scouts and all the maybe positive things that that has to offer, like the boy and girl scouts, um, and then thinking through like what are the ethics that um, that I have that might be different from that kind of a process, or what are the th and what are the alignments, and so in moving forward and trying to get people to be a part of this, or you know opening it up into um, a group beyond me and my collaborators, establishing the ethical principles at the core of that project inform all the subsequent decisions for you know aesthetic, practical. Um, and beyond. So I'm really curious to hear about, because uh, I assume, you know, I don't know how anything works. I want to hear from everybody else maybe what those kinds of considerations are in your process. Yeah, I hope we'll, we'll hear a lot about that. Um, and maybe, uh, Jess, do you want to take Yeah, I just want to, I kept wanting to jump in because, uh, Jonathan, I'd love you to talk a little bit about the other work that you do because it hasn't been brought up yet today which is the work with an, a sort of large network around the world of people working with theater with disability. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Um, the Heat Collective is, uh, it's interesting, JJ challenged me recently about you, what do you, why you call it a collective? It's just you. <laughs> and I said, and so I, <laughs> and so I, <laughs> So, uh, so what, wh and, that, and, and I have an answer, b which took me a, a few days, but I can't. <laughs> um, because really, the HEAT Collective, the reason it's HEAT, it stands for Healing, Education, Activism, and Theater. I'm a drama therapist. I'm, I'm an educator. I'm also a scholar. I'm also an activist, and, and I'll explain what that means in a second. And for the last... Um, 35 years <laughs> since I was two. No, for my, my whole <laughs> adult life, I've, be, I've been a theater artist, and it's the only thing I know how to do, unfortunately, <laughs> um, is to either teach, write, act, or direct theater. That's all I know how to do, and that's the language that I speak. So um, everything is filtered through the language of theater, but I also bring in elements of healing and drama therapy, elements of theater of the oppressed, uh, elements of playback, elements of psychodrama, elements of everything in, in the workshop, in my workshops, in my teaching, I really bring all four elements together, and that's the paradigm. It's just a paradigm. It's just an idea, and it's not a, it's just one idea. It's one approach to engagement. To me, social engagement means building community, and, um, for me, the impact is if people are talking together afterwards, and I think a really good dinner party can be just as effective as a really good piece of theater if people are engaging um, deeply and honestly. So um, I just want to say a tiny bit about the A, the activism, um, because that it can either be a, a kind of T.O., uh, it, all the wonderful things that people have talked about. I also wanted to jump in when S Sarah was talking because the impact that Sarah has, also I was, I was um, able to be a little bit a, a part of the San Francisco piece by getting some San Francisco press there. And what I found out afterwards is that every, everybody has some pride about their body of water. And so there was a great deal of pride about Sarah being in the bay, you know, for them. And, and her standing in their water brought a real sense of um, engagement. So that's the, that's the word that I'm always looking for. But the A, let me say this, that on the Theater Without Borders website, we have a s struggling piece, which is the um, artist safety um, page. And this is... I'm, I'm saying this really specifically as a call for um, support. See me if you're interested in this. And this is something that involves really reaching out to artists who are in danger in, in all over the world, but particularly performance 
artists because there are agencies and organizations that support journalists. ESA was supported uh, by an organization called Free Dimensional that helped him come to the United States. Um, there's free muse for musicians, but we are really struggling to build a network for artists at risk, th theater performance, performing artists at risk. Um, and so that means that if we have an, an actress in Afghanistan whose life is in danger because she's an actress, uh, we find ways of getting things like lawyers and visas and things that I as a theater artist am clueless about. So it just means building a network and so we have this volunteer network. So if you're interested in helping out with that, please see me. And that's the, that's the A. The theater part, I'm a playwright and a performer and part of that is I did this, my, s my big ass idea was having this Emma Goldman day yesterday. Um, I also had a play that was done at La Mama and will be done here uh, next year again. And Jonathan and I are working on it in London as well called My Heart is in the East, which brings the conversation between Jews and Muslims together. Um, so so my, my idea is bringing all four of those elements, healing, education, activism, and theater together uh, through performance and curriculum. And the only way I know that it works is if people are talking together, not to me, but with each other afterwards. So. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna bring everybody uh, here into the conversation. Um, and uh, there's a chair? There's an empty chair. And, and there's empty and chairs And more up chairs here. here if you want to I just did wanna uh, just bring up one uh, point. I'm been so inspired by what people have said already. Um, my, my work with uh, Theater of the Oppressed, I work with a group called TONYC, Theater of the Oppressed New York City. And in this question of impact has been really on my mind a lot because we work with, we collaborate with groups like Covenant House and Ali Forney Center and, and create um, you know, forum theater plays for those of you who know the BOA work, <coughs> forum theater plays with, uh, with these communities. And I think what I'm struck most by is how I bump up against my own um, limitations, my own uh, grounding, the edges of my grounding as a as a as an artist, as a person, as a a person with with prejudices and with uh, with ingrained ideas about uh, about people, and I'm constantly being challenged myself. And when I think about this question of evaluating uh, impact, it actually always starts with me. Like if I feel, and this is something that Eric just sort of reminded me of a little bit in what he was saying, but when I feel um, in, that un in the unknown, like unsteady about, oh my God, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm bumping up against ideas about my, in myself that I don't like or that I feel uncomfortable with, that's when I realize that something's going on, that there's, that there's impact, that there's something happening. Because I'm changing, I'm questioning myself a lot. And I think, you know, we can try everything we want to do to help engage people and, and make change, but I think it's got to start with us. And, and we have to change in order to embody the change around us. And so that's, that's what I've been struggling with a lot lately. I just wanted to put that into the, into the mix here. Um, please, uh, anybody who would want to participate, um, come forward or stand up or I'll hand you the microphone and I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking, what you have to say. About anything you've heard. Yeah, I see all kinds of like note writing. I'm curious <laughs> like. <w> right, <laughs> can, you, um, can you come up because um, w then they can hear you too. So uh, I, I'm convoluted and pregnant with all these ideas, and I'm a, I guess I would call myself a documentary, live documentary filmmaker. My name is Gio Geller, and I, I do films, and I started doing theater uh, before that, and I guess I've continued that as a way of, uh, of m my own experiential concepts. So my, my point is that, I believe that where we are is we're about caring for the imagination, not only the imagination 
of the individual ourselves, but of the people who see our work and the people who are collective societies. And that in, in essence, who we are is looking for our own identity in each other. And our theater and my documentaries are about individuals who are challenged, who don't have a voice, people who have spent 20 years in a mental hospital. Uh, one guy who spent 27 years of an illegal life without parole sentence in prison. And their stories are, in my mind, to give us a little light, a little insight into who we are and who we can become, because they've all seen something that maybe we can all learn from. Like you're a theater of the oppressed, and your question is, how do I know I'm making an impact? And I think <coughs> the impact we make is on ourselves, what we learn, and that I think of myself more as a social sculptor, one who looks at, at theater n without audiences at times. A and so my question is uh, to myself as well is, um, who are we and who are we, do we want to become and what will people of the future say about us today? Hi, um, I'm Nerina Kocchi, and I have a question for, sorry, I didn't get your name between Eva and Eric. Uh, Joanna. Joanna. Um, you said that um, you feel that theater artists share the same language, and it's something I really don't feel. I'm Italian. I grew up bilingual French, Italian, and I came to study in the States, and now I'm back in Europe. And um, I don't feel this language sharing. And I was wondering if you could talk a little more about your experience between the relationship between language and community. So how, I'm, I'm curious, what language do you run your workshops in? Do you have a translator? Do you have an interpreter? Um, how do you, and maybe this is for Chantal too, I mean, I'm a translator and often you struggle with how this thing that makes sense in this culture, how does it translate into another and what are, what are the points that we share as human beings and what are the ones that are really hard to get across but that are actually where the ideas get articulated. S and for me, l what is the re really the question? What is the relationship between language and community is fundamental because through language, how do we express ourselves and community for me is society and therefore the social engagement. <laughs> yeah, that, and it's a good question and it always comes up, of course, because you've been working in different countries. How do you speak to each other? Uh, 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 first of all, uh, Bond Street Theatre really focuses on physical language a lot, and body language, and there's a lot you can do without ever saying anything. If you go into a refugee camp and you're s suddenly surrounded by like 500 children, and what do you do? And you know, people ask me that. It's like, oh, I'm gonna go work in the refugee camps. What do I do? Y you know, people like this. Uh, you know, a tiger or something, you, you will just have like 500 kids following you around doing follow the leader. You don't have to say anything. Um, with adults, it's a little different, of course. And yes, we use translators uh, as we wish. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're working, in working with people that never did theater, you're trying to sort of ease them into the idea that they have a story to tell and how are they going to tell their story. And obviously they're going to tell their story with their bodies, but they're also going to tell it with their voice. So that's where for us the translators really are very important. But we start very, very simply. So if they're telling a story, you say, well, wh what, would, what would you say to the policeman who, who just was dismissive? And then they say something really, really simple. And it's like, that's okay. Because the next time they do it, they're going to say something a little bit more complicated. And next, they're, in the, they're writing their own plays. They're finding their voice. 
they're finding the language. And in a way, we're kind of the, the bystanders, uh, bystanders and, and we're sort of like guiding the process of them just finding what they want to say, what's on their mind, and, and how they're going to say it, and then shaping it so that they can do that for themselves in the future if they've never done theater before. So uh, it, it's always a challenge, of course. And there was something else that you said that was really interesting that was I want to respond to. She, she talked about the, the relationship between language and community, which I think is, I don't know. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, so um, when you're speaking to the community, of course, in their own language, this is the, the thing about doing things for people or with people or by people. When sometimes we're just guiding people to create their mm -hmm. own plays in their own language, in their own community, and that's that's the community engagement, and it's very often where you're using these kind of interactive techniques afterwards. Whereas uh, maybe not exactly forum theater, but uh, a dialogue with the audience. And sometimes we're just bystanders for that, and we're having the, the interpreter is telling us, like, what did he say? But uh, if there is a shared language, then, of course, we're a little bit more participatory. Um, in places like uh, Myanmar, where we're also working, you know, sometimes it's an English speaker. It's fortunate that there's en more English speakers around the world than, you know, it, it makes us a little lazy. But, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I speak a little Farsi now, so it's helpful. But um, uh, I think when you're engaging the audience on a very personal level like that, when you're having a dialogue with the audience at the end, uh, then you, you really deal, do need to have uh, the language, and um, if there's no words whatsoever, uh, as the we did a Romeo and Juliet without any language all throughout the Balkans during the Balkan Wars, no language is, was necessary. So it can go either way, but yet the audience was completely engaged, and um, what they said at the end, I'm not sure. You know, it's like uh, uh, you find out because you have translators. I don't know, does that answer your question? In a Chantal did, or, uh, yeah. um, so, so, as a trans, because I'm a translator, I think a lot about language, and um, I uh, I started off as a translator thinking you could you know you could bring something from one language to another. I had very idealistic notions, and then eventually I realized no, it's always an approximation. But um, I would I would say this in relation to community. Um, I am uh, originally from Canada, so language is a big thing, um, and I'm from Quebec, so it's a big thing. And um, the what the first play uh, set in the Arctic that I wrote is called Sila, and it's set in the Canadian Arctic. And I gave myself the challenge because of those power dynamics between the languages. Um, there are three. Um, uh three uh, groups represented in the play, French Canadian, English Canadian, and Inuit, which is the indigenous population in the Arctic. And I decided that each character was going to speak whatever language they would speak in any given situation in real life, which makes it a little tricky. And um, even with that, I had to compromise a little bit because I have some Inuit characters uh, in the play who in reality wouldn't speak anything other than their language. So I had to give them, give him a little bit of English and then, um, but he still has passages where he speaks only in Inuktitut. But then the play was done in, in theaters where they didn't have projection capabilities for translation. So even that I ended up, um, you know, compromising. But I think it's nice to, it's nice to be aware of the power dynamics behind languages, and it's nice to at least um, strive to do something to change that. I, as we're, uh, yeah, go ahead, Rebecca, sorry. We're just oh thinking, uh, oh, sorry, Jonathan. David? Jonathan, was that oh, you? I would like to sort of jump in, but um, maybe somebody Isa. on the mic. Isa, go ahead. Uh, then yes. oh, re okay, Rebecca, sorry. Uh, Isa and then Rebecca, Re sorry. And then Rebecca can go first. Okay. <laughs> you are such a gentleman. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be quick, I'll be quick. 
Well, we were just thinking a lot of, of this idea of language and translation and common language and whether it be between two different countries that speak different languages or communities that speak different languages, but also artists who have a specific language and maybe uh, non-arts partners who have a different language. So we do a lot of work of listening and what are the common values and what are what is the mission or what are the ideas or intents and goals and starting there so that we can develop on project to project or community to community, we are developing a common language and a common set of terms so that when we speak to each other, we know what we're, our intent is and, and what our ideas are. So that it's a very, very necessary and, and <coughs> something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about. Great, thanks. Uh, Issa. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, um, I would sort of like to jump in to say that um, we actually don't need the language because um, the body moving is a language itself. For example, I am a teacher and um, I see myself as an educator and I live between two worlds and we have um, in our daily life certain things that we're dealing with all the time that anybody on this planet can understand. Gravity, time, space, and daylight. So I can give you an example. I traveled to Sweden a couple of years ago for a conference and I was there in June. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I was there in June for about a week, and when there was no a night in June, for three and a half weeks, there's not night, you know, it's, it's continuation of daylight all the time. So I, I went back home, because that's why I run my project in the summer, and my first audience, the first person in my audience in the village is my mother. So I have to explain to her everything that I discovered in the West. So I told her about the story in northern Sweden where there's no... Uh, night for three and a half weeks and then she went like it means that the moon is lost I said no the moon is not lost so to explain to her the solar system I had to use a soccer ball a calabash it's very round and then a lamp you know so a lamp represented um, the sun calabash represented the moon and then the soccer ball represent the earth then I start sort of uh, animating the the solar system to her so she can understand what's going on with the gravity, time, and space. So I think to address some issues, we really don't need words. I say, I'm saying that because I am from a country where people speak 260 tribal languages. Mm -hmm. So we use language all the time, but most of the time, I take people from the West to work with me in the community. They don't speak the language. So the only thing we have to introduce to them is the culture. For example, the first person who comes to the village, you're not allowed to hang your uh, your leg in front of the chief. You don't cross your leg in front of the chief because it's very offensive. So that's a body language you have to understand in the culture. And then the many other things to understand in the culture that we use as a theater because life is life in self is a theater. So we actually don't need a language as long as we understand the culture. And then that's where it's like a platform to share knowledge and understanding. I think that's my take on that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Isa. Uh, Jonathan, did you want to jump in there? Um. Yes, a mute. Uh, Thank you, yeah. sir. Um, um, I, I, um, I kind of think very similarly in many ways, um, but I do tend to work with playwrights um, who, 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 despite all protestations, will sometimes resort to words, um, <laughs> even though they know probably they shouldn't. Um, and it's, it's for that reason that, that, that the motto of the Fence Network is misunderstanding each other since 2003. Um, because in that sense, uh, I agree very clearly with, with, um, with my uh, uh, Italian colleague who just asked the question. Um, but I do think it's exactly what Issa says. I think that dramaturgically, the process of translation is absolutely one of cultural understanding and cultural engagement. So actually, whether you're working with words or whether you're not working with words, the process is, is kind of pretty similar. But I really like Chantal's formulation of the notion of approximation, because it seems to me that this is life. Life is actually approximation. Whether it's uh, you and your mother in the village, uh, 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 there's never going to be the exact understanding of what it is that you're thinking and you meaning. It's only ever going to be an approximation from the point of view of the other. And therefore, the task, in a way, is to investigate the modalities of approximation and, what, and, and how to make them accessible. 
Um, so in a sense, it's a curation of that divergence, whether you choose to use language, whether you're working in refugee situations, it's always context specific, but it will always be an approximation. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, Taraj, did you want to uh, jump in here? I have, have not uh, heard from you in a bit. Um, well, I, I want to go back to the idea of measuring impact because I uh -huh. think it's such a frustrating uh, topic, uh, whether it's uh, for internal use or external use, whether it's for the funders or the audience or the artist, um, there's uh, there's something uh, you know deliciously ambiguous about theater and the impact that it has and the emotional change and it's long term and it's immeasurable and it's beautiful uh, because of it. And then we are forced into these you know, metrics, uh, whether, you know, the funders want it or we want it internally because we want to see if uh, an assumption that we had or a theory that we posed, uh, is it accurate, is it not accurate? Uh, you know, for example, if you're working with a new community, uh, we're doing a project with the Islamic Center here uh, in, in Oakland, and we've been working with them for since 2010, so this is the sixth year. And uh, you know how how, how has uh, how has this project changed? How have we changed as artists working in the at, in the center? And how has uh, the audience been impacted by our work? How how has the staff at the center been impacted by our work? Is it worthwhile? Like this question of is what I'm doing worthwhile as an artist, as an artistic director, as someone who wants to change the world. Uh, so the question of impact is an important question and to be able to understand it is really important. At the same time, um, I, uh, you know, I, I'm from Iran. I come from a culture that is driven by poetry and the endless layers of meaning in one word. And I celebrate that ambiguity and I celebrate uh, vagueness and I take pleasure in, in uh, the, uh, the quality that art and theater has that is uh, not measurable. And how do then, how do I prove to myself and prove to others that the work that I'm doing is worthwhile? I pose that as a question to, to your panel and to your participants uh, and humbly request guidance. Great, well, it's a wonderful question and one that uh, we'll continue to discuss. Um, at this point, um, what we'd like to do is, uh, we'll maybe hear from a couple more people, but it, it, we're gonna lose our uh, connection to the, uh, our, our guests who are appearing on the uh, live stream. Um, shortly, and what we'd like to do is to break this this group into smaller groups where you can really get into discussion and everybody could have an opportunity to speak to whatever uh, part of this conversation you want to continue. So what we'll, the way we'd like to organize that is to have our panelists go to different parts of this space and to have you uh, go to have a conversation with them specifically, who, whoever you'd like to continue a conversation with. So, um, uh, should we just jump right well into that, there, or do you want to? Does wanna, anyone uh, else want to um, engage with with our our international yeah, guests yeah. before they leave? Someone want to come up and talk? Cause yeah, we well have a couple away. more minutes for so that. So yeah, it'd be great if jump up, jump, jump up. up. Yeah, come, come on up. up. You back there. There's one. Yeah, there is your there. hand yeah. back there. Yes, come here. Hi, I'm Eva. Um, I just want to offer another. Uh, say your name, please. Oh, sorry. I'm Jessica Burr. And um, I run a theater company called Blessed Unrest here in New York City. And we have a sister company in Kosovo called Teatri Oda. And with them, we create uh, bilingual 
plays and we tour them around the Balkans and we perform them here in New York. But we create them um, without the need for translation. So we structure the plays um, so that if you only speak English or you only speak Albanian, you don't need a translator. And it's not an easy task, but um, I find that it's very rewarding um, in that we get to watch audiences first take in a language that often they haven't been exposed to. Albanian is fairly obscure and very ancient. Um, but also, over the course of a show, once they get the language um, sort of in their ears, they begin responding to, to mostly humor um, and to cultural things that they hadn't been exposed to before. And so I think there's a great value in that. Um, I, I agree with Joanna in that we share, we share language with theater people across the world when we jump in and start working together. And I, I run a physical theater company, um, but we do use language as well. Um, there's something in the flow of the work that's inherent, and that is, is apparent in the work. And for me, that's just extremely rewarding. Thank you. Great, Thank thanks, you Jessica. Uh, anybody else? Uh, yeah. I've, I've got a big ass idea that might actually connect these two topics that we're discussing, the impact and the language conversations. And I want to put it out there because if you want to take this idea, take it, <laughs> please, because I really want some help with it. So here's my idea. I'm going to illustrate, right? So it goes like this. You're, you see a show. Wow, what a show. That was so, that was a show. You come out of the show and there's a box and it's like, oh, a little box. It's like a photo booth kind of a thing or um, you know, like a confessional. <laughs> so you pull back the curtain, you go and you have a little seat, and there's a little screen, and you push the button, and it says, okay, tell us what you thought about the show. Ready? Three, two, one. And you're like, oh, well, um, I don't know. It made me think about this, and I had this question, and that part was cool, and I didn't really get that. And that's it. It's like a one-minute testimonial on video. And then maybe there's like three more questions, and it's like, what did you think about this particular aspect of the show? Or did you think that that idea came across? Or were you confused? You know, any sort of like leading question that you as the theater artist want to know or the funder might want to know that you can put in a little quick push a button on a screen format. And then you have the option of emailing yourself the video, sharing it on social media or not. You can opt out of all of those sharing things if you wanted to. But then there would be like a little tick box where it's like, do you mind sharing your video confessional with the people that made this theater piece or this art piece or the people that funded this art piece? And you could tick yes or no. You completely opt in or opt out, right? And that's it. The whole thing takes like two and a half minutes. And then you leave the box and you close the curtain. And why is that interesting? Because I think people are attracted to that experience of a confessional, of a private moment. It's not someone in your face with a microphone asking you what you think. It's not a baseline survey that you have to tick boxes before and then tick boxes after. And I think that that provides two things. I think it provides qualitative information and quantitative information. And if I were a funder and I were giving money to something, I would want to see not only what people thought and what their responses were to those questions, but what did their face look like, you know? How, what was their body language? So kind of connects these two ideas in the sense that we're moving past language and we're trying to figure out ways that we can actually not always have to translate our audience's experiences, but let them just speak for themselves and let them show for themselves what they thought, how they thought about it. So I'm calling it a Vox box. I don't know how to build it. <laughs> I don't know how to make the app. If anyone has any ideas, I would love to talk to you about it. Um, have they done something like that? OK, cool. I feel like it's got to be easy, right? You just got to make the little app, like a little <laughs> pop-up thingy that can fold into a little bag, and you take it, and off you go. I'm done illustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, JJ. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to uh, have all of us uh, together thank our uh, foreign uh, guests, our visitors, yeah. our telepresence, Taraj, yeah. Isa, yeah. Jonathan, thank you so much.
I, I also want to take this opportunity to just really thank Culture Hub for being, they will not be with us this afternoon, so we're, we're not going to have this option. I, um, I just uh, got my PhD in, 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 in theater uh, as a vehicle for social change and did my whole dissertation through Culture Hub and all of my committee was live streamed in <laughs> and um, decided, and it was also on HowlRound and all of HowlRound got to find out whether or not I, I passed. <laughs> so, um, she passed. But they are, uh, uh, <laughs> Thank God, but um, <laughs> it, it was it was uh, they are just such an amazing, and they they came here. Usually they're over in Great Jones in the in the Culture Hub office, but they c brought all the equipment over here this morning to to be with us and to give us this great opportunity to live stream these wonderful people. I just wondered if Rita has been has she been able to be here at all, no, Jesse? Okay. Okay, well, Rita is a wonderful um, youth program in Nigeria, but we, we got her for about three seconds, but we lost her. Anyway, they're, they're geniuses, and this is a way of really um, connecting the world uh, in, in, in a beautiful way. So thank you so much yeah, to Culture. Yeah, thanks, you guys. <laughs> Did you guys want to say something? Maybe Did you want to say? Yes. I would like to say that before we go, I would like to tell everybody that whatever we're doing, it's always possible. Any dream that we have out there, any change we want to make in the world, I know the world is, the mess, is a mess, but it's always possible. Remember that. You're not working for nothing. It will, it will, it will get somewhere. It will get us somewhere. There is a change to make. And thank you very much for putting this together. Thank you. Thank you. That's inspiring. <laughs> Yes. One yeah. Um, my one quick thing is one thing that's been on my mind, and I know we don't usually think as a theater community of Broadway as part of our community, but in a season where Oscars So White was such a focus, um, I mean, the, the Tony nominations have not come out yet, but I believe that in terms of theater with Eclipsed and Hamilton and even last year with Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, that there is theater happening that, that actually is com both commercial and impactful. And I think that we would do a disservice to ourselves in New York, especially as hard as it is to make work in New York, to try to continue to distance ourselves from the commercial world because actually that's a huge platform and with the conversations in our community about parody and about um, y voice and about bringing different perspectives and then the mechanism that we have uh, and the expediency we can, can do that with is very different than what the film um, industry has. And we always think, I think, in, um, in the theater that somehow we don't have a seat at that popular culture table or that impact table or that larger audience table or that reaching more than like 30 people or 60 people, but that we actually can with theater, and especially now with the internet and the way to be able to reach and have conversations all across the world in a place. Um, and, and also figuring out like, what is the importance still of making work in New York? It, it does New York still really have um, a leadership point of place in the theater community. Um, anyway, I, it's something that it's making me very excited to just think in kind of the larger picture about the difference between theater and film and the difference between our commercial community and what we've produced in this season and what the Oscars were doing. So that's all I wanted to add. Oh, my name is Caroline Pru. <laughs> Caroline. Um, I sense uh, everybody needs a little bit of a break, and we're going to do that as we move into these uh, smaller group discussions. So, uh, David, Jonathan. Sorry? Sorry? Just Jonathan, Jonathan just wants to I say go. something. Um, if, if, if I could. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jonathan. Thanks. Sorry. Um, just before I go, Jessica mentioned en passant um, uh, disability arts, and um, we haven't really had time to explore that, and that's fine. Um, my work is based on the premise of offers and requests, so my farewell is um, my offer, which is that if people are interested to, picking up on the mention of curious um, incident of the dog in the nighttime, if people are interested, interested to explore disability aesthetics, then um, please continue the conversation with me offline. 
Thanks very much for having me. It's been really interesting and illuminating. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Jonathan. And thank you for your generous offer. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Issa. Thank you, Taraj. Thank you, Taraj. Uh, we appreciate you <laughs> being you. here with us. And thanks, Issa. Um, we're going to say so long for now. See and you soon. But Goodbye. We will Bye. Report we'll, we'll back. Stay in touch. That's the whole idea here. Same community. Um, okay. So, in order to continue the conversations on a more more personal level, so everybody ha would have a chance to participate, we'd like to uh, move into some smaller group discussions. So we have. Uh, let me just explain the geography first of all. If you go out th this door the way you came in um, and straight back. On the right, there's a, a room we call the, s the classroom. You are the only uh, there's participant some chairs in, the in that room for one conversation. In this lobby area where the coffee and um, snacks are, uh, could have one or two uh, smaller conversations. Uh, in this room here, we could have a we could probably have about three or four different smaller conversations if we move some chairs around. So um, what I'd like to encourage is that. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to go to a particular spot and then other people to uh, follow uh, and uh, go to have a conversation with whomever they da want. David, yeah. perhaps we should um, have go in p the panelists go in pairs to each place. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How do we pair them up? So, okay, so climate change is going to be here in this room over up on this side. Uh, so, uh, what did you want to say? Rebecca um, and social community and social values. Uh, conversation will be uh, in that corner over there. Um, then we have uh, some, there seems to be a conversation about evaluation and, and uh, who wants, so that's, that would be JJ and uh, somebody else is more interested in the evaluation topic, yeah. yes? We need to say goodbye to everyone on live stream so we can get our time up. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, everybody on live stream, we're going to say goodbye to you now and move into the next <laughs> phase of our conversation. Um, thanks, Howl Around. Thank you, Culture Hub. It's been great. <laughs> All right, um, so